Good evening, everybody. Polly, I am so delighted to be here with you this evening, and I want to congratulate you being recognized as a leader of democracy by the League of Women Voters of Colorado. So let's begin our conversation. Sounds good to me. You know, I've known you for a long time, mm. and I think that some of the things that we talk about are role models. Mm -hmm. So who was your role model when you decided you wanted to get into politics? Well, you know, Ramona, I've so often been asked who my role model was or is, and I have thought and thought and thought. And you know, when I was growing up in the 40s and 50s, there were no women or minorities in professional positions. Right. So I really didn't have a role model because at that time, you know, women, um, well, I, I thought about maybe going into law because that, you know, a, a, a uh, aptitude test in ninth grade said that that might be of my an, in, an interest to me. And so I did a whole research paper on women as attorneys. And in the entire country, I only found five women that were attorneys. And they were all corporate attorneys. And that's not what I wanted to be. And so I decided, well, you know, I'll do something else. But at the same time, you know, even though it was difficult for women, it was even more difficult for Latinos. You know, in, here in Colorado and in the Southwest, we were discriminated against. And mm -hmm. it was that pain of bigotry that I experienced as a child. You know, I, you know, I'm sure you remember when the theaters and the churches were segregated and we couldn't sure. sit in the center aisles with the Anglos. We had to sit on the side aisles and in the back of, of the theaters or the back of churches. And, and that hurt, that hurt a lot. And so I, I uh, you know, even, you know, that, what, what makes that so sad is that our families had been here in Colorado since 1600. You know, we've traveled north from Mexico, you know, both of our families and mm -hmm. settled in the San Luis Valley and in Colorado uh, long before the state became a state. But after we became part of the United States, we still faced uh, a clash of cultures and, and we, we suffered from, from that bigotry. Well, that's true. I can mm -hmm. still remember as a child going into a mm -hmm. theater in Del Norte, Colorado, and it said whites and balcony was for Mexicans. And that's I remember right. that very distinctly mm -hmm. uh, when I was growing up here in Colorado as well. Well, you know, there's a lot of women now running for office and a lot of women of color. Do you think it's changed? Do you think that they have it a little, they, that things are easier now? And, and what you, you indicated a little bit about why you got into politics, but what really made you run when you decided, and I particularly want to talk about you're a great, you were known for the, being on the state senate, but how many people know that you ran for Congress as well? I ran for Congress twice and lost, but I, um, you know, it was really the pain of bigotry that caused me to run, to get into politics. You know, even though I didn't think I had a chance when I first went to college, I got so involved in young Democrats that uh, that, that led the way to my, I couldn't get a good job in Colorado, even though I graduated with honors from Colorado State University, because they had already, they, there used to be a quota on the number of Mexican Americans they would hire in the, as teachers in the Denver public school system. So, and I, I applied too late after the quota was filled. So I, uh, because, I got so involved in the 1960 campaign. I got a job in Washington, D.C. with the labor movement. And so I became an activist. I was part of the labor movement, then part of the, the uh, civil rights movement, and part of the Chicano movement, and part of the feminist movement. So I was a part of all of that activity. So when I came home in 1972, you know, we had been, we had been working so hard to get women and minorities to run for office because we weren't there. And so I knew that eventually I would run. But I thought, well, you know, I'll just get involved and, and see what happens. 1974, uh, uh, the nominee for, for state representative in my district had, um, had accepted a job as the manager of North Glen. So he had to withdraw. He couldn't be a candidate for the state house. And so there was a vacancy. And lo and behold, uh, a reporter called me, a Sentinel News reporter. And he said, Polly, I just finished talking to Shirley Whitten who was vice chair of the Adams County Democratic Party. And she said that there were three men that were interested in running for this position. But then she said that you might be interested. Oh. And I said, are, and then he said, are you going to run? 
And out of my mouth came, yes. <laughs> I hung up the phone and I said, what the hell did I just do? <laughs> I had no intention of running that fast. You know, I had no plans, but you know what, what did help was that I had worked in a lot of campaigns. You know, I had, been, I had also been in um, Bobby Kennedy's national campaign staff when he ran for president in 1968. So I knew how to run. And I, so I was successful as a legislator, but you mentioned my races for Congress. <laughs> when I uh, ran in 1980, I got the Democratic nomination. And actually, I was the first Latina in the country to, to get a major party nomination for Congress in 1980. Um, but I was running in a marginally Republican district and was, uh, was defeated. And the second time I ran, it was after reapportionment, and it was a better district for me. But the, uh, when I ran for the Democratic nomination, uh, well, I, I, it, it was very sad because I had, I had uh, by that time, I'd already been vice chair of the National Party and a state House member, a state Senate member and all and was far more qualified than my primary opponent. But unfortunately, uh, there was a rumor or a myth that a Mexican-American woman could not win that seat. Oh. And so uh, that's basically what defeated me. Oh, dear. Yeah. Well, you know, those are obstacles that we face a lot mm -hmm. of times when women try to run for uh, office. But what other obstacles? did you face once you became a member of the State House? <laughs> well, it was rather ironic, but I had no idea that when I first ran, I got pregnant <laughs> a week before the election. I, you know, I was so stunned in December to find out that, uh, that I didn't have any strange di disease when I went to the doctor, <laughs> but rather that I was just pregnant. And, uh, you know, at that time, Women, first of all, I mean, I, not only was I the, in the entire United States in 1974, I was the only Latina elected to a state house. There was a woman in the, that had just been elected to the state Senate in New Mexico, but I was the only one in the state house. And so here I am, you know, my, my aunt said, and my aunt Helen, I think you know her, she said, Polly, you know that's all they think of us, that all we can do is be, you know, be pregnant, you know, and have babies. <laughs> All we can do is have babies. And I decided, no, I'm not going to miss a single day of the legislature, and I'm not going to miss a single committee m meeting because I knew it would be used against me in the next election. And so I didn't. I just, you know, and I have, uh, that year we went longer in the state legislature than ever. There had never been a legislative session that lasted as long as we did. We adjourned on July 1st at uh, 527, no, about 6, six o'clock. My son chose to be born the next day at 527. Oh my goodness. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> it was, and there is a picture of me on the front page of the, the Denver Post, the day, you know, the last day of the session when we're trying to adjourn with my hand up so you can see me all in my glory. <laughs> Well, you just proved one thing. <laughs> Women can do a lot of things at, one, at the same time. We know how to do things more than just one. We can tool. multitask. That's, you've got it. We can multitask, <laughs> right. definitely. Well, you know, you, you became a very well-known state representative, uh, not only in the state of Colorado, but throughout the country. And how did you establish yourself in the state legislature? getting the kind of recognition that you so much deserved when you worked so hard as a state representative? Well, you know, um, that's what it was. It was just working hard. You know, you just go in and you just, um, you know, make sure that you're, you're present and that you have ideas and you speak up. And I learned how to speak while I was in the state legislature. I had not given very many speeches prior to that, but I sure learned how to do it while I was there. And I, I uh, my colleagues uh, elected me as chair of the House Democratic Caucus. I was the first woman to ever chair the House Democratic Caucus in the state of Colorado. And uh, I was elected, I think, in 1977 in that legislative session. And then I went off to the state Senate in 78, and uh, there had never been another minority woman, another woman of color elected to the Colorado State Senate. And you know something? I didn't realize I was making history at that point. That was, that was, I had, I had decided I was going to stay in the House because I wanted to be Speaker, and I thought I'd just stay there when 
a, a delegation of women in my district came to me and they said, Polly, we've never had a woman in the state senate from Adams County. And uh, you know, the, the current state senator was, was, had decided not to run, so you have to run. And they twisted my arm. And Senator Richard Regis Groff called me. Oh and he made me have, he said, we have to have lunch. When we had lunch, he said, you have to run. I need you in the state senate. And that's why I ran for the state senate and got elected. <laughs> It was, uh, it was quite by, I always say it's just that I said yes. I just kept saying yes, and that, that really made the difference. Well, that's, <laughs> that's very commendable, I tell you. It's <laughs> tough to hang in there like you did. But what is, you know, you have two beautiful children. You have beautiful grandchildren. Yes. So <laughs> what, but other than your family, which I know you're very proud of, what is the most the uh, other thing that you're very proud of, of, of your life, of, of the things that you've accomplished? I think there are two areas. One was when I was, you know, I served, when I served in the state legislature for 12 years, there were only two years that we were in the majority. That happened to be my first two years in the state house, and I got to help elect the very first Hispanic speaker, the very first person of color as the speaker of the house, and that, of course, was our dear friend Ruben Valdez, you know, who just passed away recently. And then uh, I, I was, you know, because I was involved nationally at the same time, I knew about legislation that was being talked about nationally. So I was the very first state legislator sta uh, in 1980 to introduce a bill for pay equity. And I didn't get it passed, you know, we were in the minority. It took 40 years for it to become law. <laughs> Last year, I was invited to the signing ceremony of, my, of that bill, and it finally became law. But I think the, most, the bill that I was most proud of was, was a bill that I didn't get passed. It was to get uh, sanitation services for farm workers. And you know, if you had a farm with more than 10 farm workers, I believed they ought to provide sanitation services. Couldn't get it passed. Got a Republican in the House to carry it for me. We couldn't get it passed. But I happened to sit on the National Endowment for Democracy board. And uh, it was the strangest, these big powerful people that sat on that board, including Henry Kissinger and, and, you know, and Madeleine Albright and, and Secretary of Labor Bill Brock, who sat right next to me because we, they sat us in alphabetical order. There were 17 of us, so they put, we sat us around the table in alphabetical order. So right next to me sat Reagan's appointee as Secretary of Labor. So I said to Secretary Brock, you know, I've been trying to get this legislation passed, you know, for health reasons. You know, you ought to have sanitation facilities on the farms. And I can't get it passed. And uh, would you think about ordering it, you know, doing an executive order about that? And he looked at me and said, well, you know, normally that's, you know, passed in the state legislatures. And I said, yeah, but we can't get it done. And he said, well, I'll look into it. A year later, it took him a whole year, but a year later, he issued an executive order that not only Colorado, but farmers throughout the country wow. had to have sanitation services for their farm workers if they had more than 10 employees. So I got so excited about that because I didn't get it done, but I, so I, maybe I, I made it happen anyhow. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's so important. Some of the boards, some of the committees that you were on, you made such an impact. I've heard a lot about some of the things that you've done. In, in over the course of your career in uh, elected office. Uh, you know, we talk, I said, I mentioned a little earlier that there's more Latinas running, there's more yes. women of color. What would you tell uh, young Latinas that are deciding if they're interested in entering pol political, uh, the political arena? Uh, I know that when they run, they call, they ask for advice, mm -hmm. and what advice would you give them? You know, um, you know, Ramona, we all have challenges in life. You know, I know you've had them and I've had them, everybody does. But it's not the challenges that count, it's how we respond to those challenges. So I always tell young Latinas, you know, you can do whatever you want, but you have to know that you can do that and not be afraid. Don't be afraid. You know, if you want to do something, get in there and get your feet wet. You know. Um, Take, you know, work hard, learn as much as you can every day, and then 
opportunity will present itself. And when it does, go for it. And, and you know, enjoy it. And it's okay if you lose. As, as I think we mentioned earlier, I lost two races for Congress. But you know, that was okay. I learned a lot from running for those, those races. And m maybe I helped people that came along later, you know, get elected. You know, so, so it's about taking that risk. Don't be afraid to take a risk, go for it. And it's okay, as a matter of fact, I think it's more important to be a gracious loser than it is to be a good winner. Oh, thank you, Polly. That's good advice. <laughs> That's very good advice. Well, you know, I know you have a birthday coming up soon. Yes. <laughs> we, we were planning a big party for that, right? Oh, but yes. no party, uh, no. no party because of COVID. Uh, so uh, I do want to wish you a happy birthday. And I hope you have many, many more. And it's good seeing you today, even though, uh, you know, we have to set apart and we have to wear our masks when we leave here. But uh, right. I want to wish you a happy birthday. Thank you so much, exactly. Ramona, and thank you for, for sharing all of this with me. It was and my I, pleasure and my honor. And I want to thank the League of Women Voters for, for, for this amazing award. And I'm both humbled and honored. Thank you, Polly.